Now then, let's take our Bibles, please, and turn tonight, beginning in Galatians chapter number 2. Galatians chapter number 2, for a moment, in your Bibles, familiar verse of Scripture, which I want to help us understand a little better, a whole lot better tonight. As we think about the crucifixion of our Savior, I could not help but think about God's call in the Scriptures to those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, His Son, to the crucified life. And I'd like to, with God's help, explain to you this evening what specifically it means when the Bible calls us to be crucified with Christ. In Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number 20, the Apostle Paul, inspired by God, writes these words. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Well, let's pray together, shall we? Father, these uh, words on a page in the Bible are, uh, are written for our admonition. But we need to understand what they mean, and then we need your help to do that. We also need your assistance in making personal application to our lives concerning this uh, issue that is brought up in Galatians 2 and verse number 20. I pray, Father, in heaven that the Spirit of God will uh, fulfill those uh, promised uh, responsibilities tonight. Take these words and uh, this message... And open our eyes of understanding to see ourselves in our own personal needs. And wherever it is in our lives that uh, we need to uh, nail to the cross, I pray that you'll give us your grace that we may be able to say with the Apostle Paul, uh, with all honesty, I am crucified with Christ. And so help us to that end. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul lived what we would call the crucified life, but what exactly does the crucified life mean? References to the crucified life are numerous in the New Testament, and this evening I'd like to take you to at least four passages in the Bible that explain to us what it is that needs to be crucified in the life of the dedicated, sincere child of God if we're to live the Christ life the way Paul lived it, and of course the way Jesus lived it, and the way Jesus would call us to live the Christian life. And so tonight I want to take you beginning with uh, Matthew chapter number 10 to the first time that this uh, idea is presented by the Lord to his disciples. Matthew chapter number 10 is early in the public ministry of Christ. This concept of uh, bearing one's cross is likened unto the statement of the Apostle Paul being crucified with Christ. Uh, people today, they tattoo crosses they, on their bodies. They may uh, wear crosses as jewelry. Uh, but there was really only one reason to carry a cross. In the Roman days, if you were bearing a cross, you were bearing a cross because you were going to be crucified. And so it is when Jesus uh, compels his disciples during his public earthly ministry to take up their cross and follow him, it was an unmistakable call to the crucified life. He was saying to them, there's something that needs to be nailed to the cross in your life. If you're going to be a follower of mine, if you're going to be a disciple, this is what you must do. Now the context of Matthew chapter number 10 and verse number 38, when Jesus makes this statement, and let's look at it if we could. And he says, he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Well, verse number 38, of course, is uh, nearing the end of a lengthy uh, passage of instruction beginning at verse number 5 of Matthew chapter number 10 to a group of men, a group of very special men, apostolic men, 11 of whom will meet again one day. These, of course, of whom I speak are the 12 disciples of the 12 apostles. This is uh, soon after their calling uh, by the Lord by their surrender to do his will, Jesus met with them and he gave them a mission. 
Their mission was to go and speak of Jesus to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as he calls them. This was a ministry of evangelism. It was a ministry of sharing Christ and his Messiahship with Jewish people, confirming with them that Jesus Christ was indeed the promised Messiah spoken of so many times in the Old Testament scriptures. Now, his instructions included a statement here that we read a moment ago, that he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Jesus is, in that statement, he's telling these men that this call to ministry has a price, a price that will, uh, will demand that you nail something to the cross of your life as it were. Now, within this passage of Scripture, uh, Jesus does not give to them real encouraging words, at least not very many. Uh, for example, I want you to notice uh, verse number, uh, number 12. He says, When you come into a house, salute it, and if the house be worthy, let your peace be come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. In this call of Jesus to go with a gospel message to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Jesus made it very, very plain that they would not always be received by the people to whom they would speak. Now, nothing has changed in 2,000 years, has it? There are many that will not receive, will not welcome us into their home, will not welcome the message of Christ into their lives. And Jesus forewarned these men. Now, they're, they're ready to go out on this journey. He's promised to them the power of the Spirit of God that will be with them as they preach and as they'll have power to cast out devils, devils and work various miracles. Nevertheless, Jesus said, when you go and you share this news with these people, there will be some who will not receive you. Verse number 16, he makes it even plainer when he says, I'm sending you forth as sheep among wolves. Now, if you're a sheep, uh, you would not be excited about that. Because wolves love sheep. They love them to eat. <laughs> and uh, so the statement here is, it's going to be as if, when you go out and witness for me, it is as if you are going to be devoured by wolves. Now, if you've ever wondered why it is that many Christians, most disciples of the Lord, have very little interest in getting involved in telling people about Jesus Christ, I think you can understand why. Because nothing has changed, and human nature has certainly not changed, and it is as if we go into a world as sheep among wolves when we take the glorious message of the gospel to a lost and dying world. Within that context, Jesus said, you know, if you're going to come after me, if you're going to go out and share this good news that I'm giving to you that not everyone will receive, you're going to have to carry a cross. And that cross, you're going to have to nail something on it if you are going to follow after me and be a good witness. Not only that, he went on in the passage in chapter number 10 and verse number 17, forewarning these men that they would be delivered up. That means they would be arrested by councils. That would be Jewish councils. He says they would be scourged in the synagogues. Now, a scourging was a very, very serious beating. He said, you're going to be brought before governors and kings. Uh, he said, went on to say, verse number 21, same conversation, same 12 men. He said, you're going to find that even your family is going to reject you. Uh, brothers will, uh, will uh, betray their brothers, and parents will betray their children, and children will betray their mothers and their fathers. Uh, he said in verse 22 that they would be hated of all men for Christ's sake. He said they would be persecuted, verse number 23. And he said in verse 24 of chapter 10, and you should not expect any less than this because after all, the disciple is not above his master nor the servant above his Lord. Now in verse number 32, he, uh, he makes this statement that I want you to see. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth, 
I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth, his, loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not uh, worthy of me. Now, all of this is leading up to the statement that we read a few moments ago in verse number 38. He goes on and, and, and tells them they may even lose their lives. The idea, very simply, is this. Taking up our cross and following Jesus Christ involves telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ and willingly accepting the negative consequences of sharing our faith. This is the crucified life. Anyone and everyone who takes this matter of witnessing seriously will find their, themselves placed in situations that are very disturbing, that are very frightening oftentimes, that could cause you to want to turn and flee. But God is telling us here that the bearing of the cross in the Christian life is nailing our fears to the cross of Calvary and witnessing with compassion and boldness to a lost and dying world of the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. We have been left by Christ here as ambassadors. We are here as witnesses. We are here to be the voice of Christ to a lost and dying world. We are here as the hands of Christ and the feet of Christ. And our lives individually and then collectively as a New Testament church and churches around the world, we are the body of Jesus Christ. And Christ came to save sinners. And so it is that he's left you and me here to also participate and be actively engaged in that ministry. But that involves nailing your fears to the cross. It involves saying, I will do what God calls me to do. I will take up the cross and I will follow Jesus Christ. Uh, there are some in this room. Because you came to Christ and you stood for Christ and you witnessed to others for Christ, you no longer have friendship or fellowship with your own blood relatives. They no longer want to be around you. They don't uh, gather together with you at holidays. They don't remember your birthday or your anniversary or any, any such thing in your life. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about. But the consequences of living for Jesus Christ and specifically of speaking up for Jesus Christ. And by the way, let me say this. You can talk about God pretty freely in the world in which we live. But I'll tell you what, Jesus, the name of Jesus separates the situation. It changes the dynamics of it. Uh, they can just very generically talk about God. But my friend, when you begin talking about Jesus Christ, and when you begin saying that he is the exclusive way to heaven, that he is the door to heaven, that he is the bread of life, that he is the water of life, that he is the way and the truth and the life, and that no man can come unto the Father except by him. My friend, you have placed yourself in a category that is unacceptable with the world and its way of thinking, particularly in the day in which you and I live. Now, we have two choices. We can be silent. Or we can speak up. Those who choose to speak up will pay the price. And they are the ones who follow Christ bearing their cross. They are just as afraid as the rest of us who will not witness. They are, they are just as bothered and hurt by the rejection of others. And nevertheless, these men... Uh, wonderful examples to you and me tonight. They, after listening to this, uh, would you call it a pep talk? <laughs> Hardly. It certainly would not be what the coach would say to his team as he sends them out onto the floor. But you know, Jesus, with great candor, he told these men what was waiting for them if they would go and witness of him to others. And as a result, they would have to bear their cross and follow him. And so it is that when the Bible talks about the crucified life, 
you and I must crucify our own feelings, our own fears, our own need for acceptance, and realize that we have a much more important matter at hand, and that is to rescue the perishing and care for the dying. God has chosen through the foolishness of preaching to save souls. That includes not only public declarations of the gospel as I gave this morning as a part of the morning message in 8.30 and 10.45 or that I gave on Friday and uh, this la Thursday of this last week at the, the home going of Brother Heine Happily. But my friend, that includes your witness also. You know, it's a wonderful thing to, and it's essential that you and I live and act like Christians. The fact of the matter is, if you're not going to live and act like a Christian, I just assume you're not giving any gospel tracts from North Love Baptist Church. All right? I'd really just assume you're not witness. But can I tell you, just living the Christian life in front of people that are unsaved is not enough. Somebody's got to pry open their jaws and start talking. And letting people know that Christ loves them. And that he is the son of God and that he came to this earth and died for their sins. Can I ask you a question? Would you have gotten saved if you had the level of witness that you give to other people? Are we not watchmen? Is that what the Bible says? Are we not the ones who are called to warn? Are we not the ones who will carry their blood on our hands? If we refuse to lift up our voices and speak up for Christ? <clears throat> Honestly, there are two ministries in our church that are the, the weakest. Number one is prayer. And number two is witnessing. Biblically speaking, those two ought to be number one and number two. You say, well, I want to live the crucified life. Well, then accept the challenge that Jesus gave to these men and begin to witness or begin to witness again of Christ. Bearing his reproach. Accepting the consequences that will come your way. But can I tell you, you'll have here and there, you'll have, you'll have blessings that will certainly go a long ways in helping to overcome the, the pressures and the disappointment of being rejected. I think of the day that I enjoyed today with our friends Dave and Vicki Abram. This Jewish man and his wife, and consequently because of their salvation some 20 some years ago, took me three years, took God three years to get through to him, he used me three years. I can't tell you how many, mile, how many meals I, brought, I bought that Jewish man before he came to Christ. Honestly, I, I told you he was Jewish. So. <laughs> Only exceeded in their tightness by Dutch people, I think. <clears throat> but he, uh, the, day, the day he got saved on a Tuesday afternoon, he and I had he'd driven, uh, he'd lived on the north side of Chicago at the time in the Gold Coast there. And uh, came out to hear me preach at uh, Brother Gomez's church, the Preacher's Fellowship. And afterwards, we went to his home. And uh, from early in the afternoon until about 6 o'clock that night, we went over the scriptures again and again and again. I love the story of the, the Philip and the eunuch from Ethiopia. And uh, reading out of the Old Testament Isaiah, and of whom does he speak? And he opened his mouth and preached unto him Jesus. There's so many unmistakable evidences in the Old Testament that Christ is the Messiah. But you know, that was a long and lengthy ordeal with that man. But to listen to him get saved. I didn't even get to the Romans road. He actually stood up in his living room, lifted his hands to the heavens, and said, Paul, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that he died for my sins. <laughs> that moment his life was transformed. And I, I knew it was real because he paid for dinner that night. <laughs> yes, he did. 
He said, uh, we'll go wherever you want. And he said, and I'll buy. I said, this is real. <laughs> I didn't know the restaurants there in the north side of Chicago, but I figured it out. I said, well, Dave, let's go someplace where they valet park your car. <laughs> and I knew that would be a good restaurant. And sure enough, it was. And uh, what a joy this afternoon to, to sit at the table with he and his wife and their daughter, each of them in Christ, her parents now in Christ, and his wife a therapist uh, by trade, her parents uh, professors at the University of Wisconsin, now born again, her brother a biochemist with a large pharmaceutical company, now born again and went to seminary and trained and now minister of the gospel. You see. Oh, sure, there are a lot of people, but there, it's a cross. But I'll tell you the rewards. There are rewards that are amazing and they're wonderful. Not, uh, not seven days go by in my life that somebody that doesn't through a written letter or through a phone call or through an email but through a personal testimony, seek me out to tell me how they came to Christ through some aspect of the ministries here, somebody here. Now, we're not anywhere near where we need to be in this matter, but I'm sure glad for everybody that takes this matter of witnessing of Christ seriously. It is a cross that you, you bear, but uh, that's what the crucified life is all about. And one day, you know, we're going to be on the other side of the cross. And we'll enjoy forever and ever and ever the fellowship similar to what I enjoyed this afternoon with, with our friends, the Abrams. We'll get to do that forever and ever. So that's number one, the crucified life. What is it? Well, it's a life, Jesus said, it's telling people about Jesus and being willing to endure the consequences of their rejection. Number two, secondly, in Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter number 16, almost verbatim, but not exactly the same. About three years later, now we're getting very close to the cross of Calvary. Jesus is again speaking to his disciples. And in verse number 24 of Matthew 16, then said Jesus unto his disciples, <clears throat> If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, <clears throat> the context of this passage, as is always true in the Bible, is very important to understand its meaning. And when you read the Bible, you study the Bible, I, I, would, uh, I would ask you to please be careful to uh, study the context in which something is said and study the scriptures on it. Rightly divide the Bible. Or you can end up caught up in, uh, in all kinds of isms and schisms and false doctrine and false teacher, teaching. And uh, when you study the context here, it's not the same situation. In fact, what has just occurred in that context is the Lord Jesus uh, has opened the the door to this wonderful blessing that we're enjoying right now, and that is the church. You see, up until that time, uh, they didn't have churches, but Jesus uh, said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, I'm going to be about building congregations of believers that are baptized and that are joined together, committed to one another and committed to following me through following biblical leadership. I'll give them pastors and they'll be like sheep and the pastor will be like their shepherd. And they'll represent me and they'll work at, and, uh, in the world and reaching people with a gospel message. But then immediately following that, notice what Jesus said, verse number 21. From that time forth Jesus began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Now, the response of Peter 
and the other disciples, I think Peter's just the individual that's the spokesman, they were all aghast at this idea. You see, all along, they thought when they were leaving their fishing occupations or leaving their places of business and becoming disciples and following Jesus, they thought all along that Jesus would end up overthrowing the Roman government. He would restore Israel back to its rightful place as a, an independent nation, and Jesus would rule over them and usher in what they read in the Bible of what we, in the Old Testament, what we call the millennium. What they failed to see was uh, uh, Psalm 22 and Isaiah chapter 53 and other great passages of Scripture that talk about the suffering of our Savior and His dying uh, for our sins. So when Jesus broached the subject with the men and He said, listen, fellas, here's where we're headed now. We're going to go to Jerusalem. I've got to go there because soon I will be arrested and I am going to be crucified and three days later I'm going to raise from the dead. Now then Peter... Notice verse number 22. Uh, Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. So uh, it, it literally means he grabbed him uh, as if by the shoulders and shook him. And now uh, Jesus responds, verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now this is integral to understanding his next statement. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What does it mean to savor the things that be of men rather than to savor the things that be of God? It is a paradox of sorts. The word savor has behind it the idea of an appetite for. And he's simply saying to Peter, he's saying, Peter, you do not have an appetite for eternal things. You don't have an appetite for the things of God. You have the appetite of the world. Now that is not saying that the appetite in and of itself is sinful. He's not talking about he's lusting after something literal there. But it's a mental outlook that Jesus is reproving. Peter grabbed the Lord and shook him and said, Be this far from thee. Because Peter couldn't even conceive of the idea of not becoming a success in the eyes of the world, a leader in the eyes of the world. Remember, all, each of those men battled with this idea. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? They all wanted to be successful leaders, admired by everyone else. Why? Because that's the way the world thinks. But Jesus said, do not savor, do not mentally gain an appetite for the things of this world, but rather have a mental appetite for the things that are of God. In other words, Peter, you need to think like God and not think like the people of this world. Now, he goes on to explain this paradox in verse number 25. And 26 and 27 and 28, for that matter, Notice verse 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now, what is the contrast between the way the world thinks and the way God thinks in this paradox? Well, what does it mean to save one's life? It means to look out for number one. Now, is that not the philosophy of the world? You better take care of number one. That's the way the world thinks. That's the way Peter tended to think. And Jesus said, you're going to have to deny yourself that kind of thinking. And you're going to have to realize that you may have to be, in the world's eyes, listen to this, a loser. He said, the loser in my kingdom is the winner. The winner in the world's kingdom is the loser. Now he's not talking about necessarily the idea of, of uh, salvation. He's talking about our, our idea of the management of the business of our lives. You know, to even other Christians, we seem very, very foolish. Uh, you probably have Christian friends. They think you go to church way too much. They think, they think you're in a cult and that you're a fanatic. 
and if they saw what you gave, they would think you were insane. They'd say, well, how in the world? Why? Why? Because you do not savor the things of this world. You and I are not to, not to live our lives and manage the business of God on the same principles that the world bases its principles to say, well, you got to look out for number one. Notice the second statement that he makes here. And he talks about a, a real popular business word, word. Verse 26. For what is a man, what's the next word? Profited. If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Now, I think about this. Uh, how wealthy would you be if you gained the whole world? Uh, you'd be a pretty, pretty wealthy person, wouldn't you? Does that not drive the world in which we live? They're chasing it. You know, I'm going to be happy just when I get to this level. Man, I'll tell you, I won't have any more fears when I get to this position. I tell you, that's foolishness. Do you know that people in big houses commit suicide just like people in little houses? Or people with no houses at all? Do you know people in big homes get divorces just like people in little homes or no homes at all get divorces? Do you know that? People that drive new cars, they have problems and issues and take pills to calm down and pills to get excited and pills to go to bed at night, and pills to get up in the morning, just like the folks do in the old cars and in the little homes or no homes at all. I am simply saying this. Jesus is pointing out to Peter, here's your problem. Your problem is you have the wrong business model. And you're going to have to nail that business model to the cross. Deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow me. Can I ask you a question? Why is it that four out of seven people in our world do not even know about Jesus Christ? I'll tell you what it is. It's not because God hasn't called people to take the message to them. It's because people, God's people, savor the things of this world and not the things of God. That's what it is. You know, a lot of things in life. And I listen, I want you to do whatever God calls you to do, and there's it's nobility in it as long as it's not dishonest. Or, there's nothing wrong with that. And I also think that most Christianity uh, is, ought to be bi bivocational. I really think that's it. Heaven's sake, even the Apostle Paul, uh, when he went to Corinth and started a church, he was bivocational. So there should be no criticism in that at all. Fact of the matter is, if you were a Jewish boy growing up in a Hebrew home, you, you may study the letters to get a business, business uh, where you could, you know, use your head, but you also had to learn a trade. Everybody did. I'm not, I want you doing exactly what God wants you to do, but while you're doing that, don't get caught up in the business model of the world and think, you know, man, it's just going to have more and more and more. I know people, they don't go to church anymore. Why? Because they're too busy making money. Where are they? And what kind of message are they teaching their children? What kind of message are they saying to others? They're saying, you know where, you know what my wife revolves around? It revolves around getting more money. No, I know there are occupations that demand. That dem I'm glad the doctors and the nurses and I'm glad the policemen and the firemen, I'm glad they're at work on the Lord's Day. <laughs> Listen, you, just, you, you do your job. You know, but a lot of us, we, we have options of what, to, what we do and when we do it. So what is the crucified life? Uh, Jesus said, you've got to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And within the context, he was rebuking a way of thinking that is the world's way of thinking. And he was extolling God's way of thinking, which is much bigger picture. You see, he's saying, invest your assets, your life, in the things that will count for eternity. Yeah, take care of your family. That's great. But invest your life in that which is of eternal significance. In fact, he goes on and he says, uh, verse number 28. And it seems at first glance that this doesn't even fit in with what we're talking about, but it does. Verily I say unto you that there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, do you know what he was talking about there? 
he was talking about chapter number 17, what happened next. And that is the transfiguration of Christ. Jesus took Peter and uh, James and John, and he, chapter 17, he brought them up into a mountain. There, Jesus gained back again some of the physical glow and glory that he possesses in heaven. And these men were thrilled and they were amazed. But two uh, very, very uh, important men came and visited Jesus there on that mountain. And these men are representative of what Jesus is talking about to his disciples in chapter 16 when he says to them, deny yourself. Don't get caught up in the, the world's idea of the race for success. But think of the bigger picture. Now, who met Jesus there on the mountain? Two men, Moses and Elijah. Now, and how are Moses and Elijah spoken of in the New Testament? First of all, Moses made his way into chapter number 11 of the book of Hebrews. And what does he talk about? Could have said a lot of things about Moses, but what does Hebrews 11 tell us about Moses? When he came of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You know what? That was, a, that was an idiotic business decision. You know, he could have said, man, I'll tell you what, as Pharaoh's daughter... I have access to millions and millions and millions of bullion of gold and I've got power and authority. I have everything at my disposal that could advance the cause of God's people and God's, God's name. But you know, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Why? The next verse, Hebrews 11 says, because he looked forward to the recompense of the reward. In other words, he said... Hey, so what if I grow up in Pharaoh's household and I have the nicest and the best of everything, but I miss out on God's will for my life and I die and I leave it all behind? He said, you know, I think it's a better business decision to throw my lot in with the people of God and God's will. And sure, it's going to be sacrificial, but those rewards and blessings I'll be able to enjoy forever and ever and ever. Tell me, who's the wiser businessman? Well, certainly it's Moses. How is Elijah spoken of in the New Testament? Well, James chapter number 5 tells us in verse 17 that Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. In other words, he, he is made of the same stuff that you and I are made of. But he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Now you think about that. You know what he knew was happening when he prayed that it might not rain? He knew that that would cripple their economy. He knew that that would put their, their world in a tailspin. But he also knew that it would capture the attention of God's people and it would bring them to a place of renewed faith in God and also faith to remove the idolatry of the false prophets out of their, out of their country. And he was willing to make that sacrifice for the bigger picture. And so I'd like to say to you this evening, when you think about Paul saying, I'm crucified with Christ, what is the crucified life? Well, it is, it is a life that, in which we, we build our business around the cross and around eternity and not according to this world. Number three, Romans chapter number six. In Romans chapter number six, we you see this uh, truth once again. In verse number one, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? There's a passage to believers about living the victorious Christian life. He then goes into a brief uh, application of baptism and uh, speaking of believers baptism and then also of the planting of a seed that must die and be planted in the ground in order to be resurrected and then he says in verse number six knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin so the crucifixion with Christ that he's spoken of here, or speaking of here in this passage, 
He calls it the body of sin or the old man being crucified. And what is he talking about there? Well, the destroying of the body of sin is not its removal. There, there's nobody here that's going to reach a point this side of eternity where you're never going to sin. Nobody becomes sinless. But, bless God, we could sin a lot less. And the idea behind this is that, that uh, we've got to crucify the old man. Now, the old man is not your father, all right? The old man is the old you. He's the old me. Now, by the way, the word destroyed means to be rendered useless or idle. In other words, the crucifixion uh, analogy is really appropriate. He's simply saying, you know, you use those hands for evil. He said, you're going to nail, nail those to the cross. You know, your feet took you places you ought not to have gone. So you nail those to the cross. He's saying, you've got to nail the old man to the cross. That's the idea behind the crucified life. It is the idea of putting off what the Bible calls the old man. In uh, Ephesians 4.22, the Bible calls this old man the former conversation. Now, conversation, we think of two people talking together. But biblically, a conversation is our lifestyle. Now, before people are saved, they have a style or a way of living that if it's wrong, that when they get saved, it needs to change. Uh, I, would, I would like to suggest to you that if you is what you was, then you ain't. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And I realize that's a process. It's progressive. But my friend, to not move anywhere, not change at all, is indicative of no real change inside. The old man here is the former conversation. It means the old way of living. And I like the old song, you know, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. Yeah. Colossians 3, 5 describes this old man as, uh, and his crucifixion in this way. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And now he's going to name some of these that need to be nailed to the cross. They're a part of the lifestyle of the old man. Fornication uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. Later on in verses 8 and 9, he adds these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. What is the crucified life? It's a, it's a life where we nail the old man to the cross. Those things that in our lives that are part of our lifestyle... We have to nail them to cross of Calvary. Galatians 5.24 says it this way. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust thereof. Finally, look with me at Galatians chapter number 6. Galatians chapter number 6. This is the fourth and final application in the New Testament. Explaining the meaning of the crucified life and its application. It is nailing our fears to the cross Telling people about Jesus, willing to endure any afflictions that may come our way. Matthew 10. It is nailing the business models of this world to the cross and determining to live our lives with a bib biblical business model. Uh, Matthew chapter number 16. It is nailing our sinful desires and our deeds of our flesh to the cross. Here as we've seen in the book of Colossians. But now in Galatians 6 and verse number 14. The Bible says, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Now, I know the Bible says God loves the world. And that's talking about the people of the world. What he's talking about here is that same application that we see in 1 John. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now the world of Paul's day, if you read the context there of Galatians chapter number 6, 
They esteemed and they honored people that were religious but not righteous. They caused people to glory in their accomplishments in their flesh. Paul said that I have to crucify the world unto myself. And so here you have it. When he said in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. This is what he meant. This is what Jesus meant when he said, deny yourself and take up the cross and follow me. You know, people that do not bear the cross, they, they get to go to heaven too. But can I tell you, I've observed over the life that uh, many, many wonderful people with great potential, because they were unwilling, unwilling to adopt a business model that's biblical, they forfeited eternal blessing and reward because they were unwilling to witness for Jesus Christ, unwilling to nail their fears to the cross. They missed out on opportunity and personal responsibility. And they could have made such a difference because of not, sometimes just one area of their flesh. They were so good in everything else, but they're just one area they would not nail to the cross and it became their undoing. And how many have become enamored with all the, the applause of the world and all of its uh, glitter and have forsaken the crucified life for a moment in the limelight of the world? My friend, it's far better to be obscure in this world but well-known in heaven. But that's what the crucified life is all about. 